John chapter 12. Now we, we are in a, a long series of teachings that has to do with the cooperative actions that we are to take to function with Christ. And so that the life of Christ that is in us is not in vain, but rather that that life might function through us. So it's not just about what God has done for us, but it's what is he doing with us and what is he doing through us. So we are on that long series, but in the process of, of studying um, how do we participate with Christ, it is important that we, can, that we are to be sensitive to the guidance and the leading of the Spirit of God. And that we are to be sensitive to his voice and as he speaks. So specifically, today we are talking about God's, God's guidance. Amen? And um, we're going to go over on the side of his speaking. But let us begin by looking at John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Hallelujah. And let's pick it up in verse 20. There were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was at Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we want to see Jesus. So the Gentiles came to Philip and said, We want to see Jesus. And Philip came, cometh, and telleth Andrew. And Andrew and again, Andrew and Philip, they came and told Jesus. These Gentiles, the Greeks, and so on, they are here, and they want to see you. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat, fall into the ground and die, it abided alone, but if it died, bring it forth much fruit. Now they asked Jesus, they said, Jesus, the Greeks are here and they want to see you. And listen to the answer that Jesus gave. Jesus said, the Son of Man, the hours come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And except a corner, we fall into the wrong and die to bad alone. But if it died, bring it forth much fruit. What kind of answer is that? Jesus, they want to see you. What are you saying? What was Jesus saying? Jesus was saying, yes, the Gentiles want to see me. And they need to see me. However, as it is right now, I am trapped in this body. And I can only be in one place at one time. There is no way I can be here and be in South America and in Asia and in Africa and in Mozambique. And I can't be in, in, in two places at the same time trapped in this body. But the hour has come <clears throat> when I am going to be glorified, when I'm going to die as a corn of wheat, I will go into the ground as a single seed. But when I spring up, uh, there is going to be a supernatural multiplication that will take place. And that seed will be multiplied and will bring forth much fruit. So that here I am right now, trapped in this body. But once I die and I'm raised up, then I am going to be born into the multitudes that will receive me as Savior and Lord. So today, as we are part of the body of Christ, Jesus has a new body. And it is not the one that you walk the shores of Galilee with. But it is your body and it is mine. And everywhere a believer goes, it is the will of God that, that, that Jesus would have representation. That God would have representation and that we would be the manifestation of him in every place. Amen? That is why it is so, it is so important for us to learn to cooperate with the reality of the truth of the fact that Christ is within us. The hope of glory. If Christ is in you, he is there for a purpose. <clears throat> and it is to live his life through you. It is for you to be the fragrance of him in every place. That is the reason why the essence of the, essence of the gospel is Galatians 2.20. That uh, it's no longer I that live, but it is Christ that liveth in me. And the life I live, I live by the faith of the Son of, Son of God. That's why the essence of the gospel is Galatians 1 verse 15 and 16 where Paul says that, that God, God called him from his mother's womb to reveal his son in him and to preach that son, Jesus, that is revealed in him to preach him among the Gentiles. 
That's what the gospel is all about. That Christ might manifest his life through you. And, that, and as a result of that, we the church, his body, is the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Which means what? That through the church, he gets representation in every sector of society and in every place on the planet. Amen? Amen. So hence the need for us to cooperate with him. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Glory to God forevermore. Now, let's talk about um, the issue of being led by the Spirit of God and hearing God. Because if you're going to cooperate with Him, and if you're going to yield to that life of Christ in you, we need to know how. We need to be able to follow after Him. We need to hear His voice. Jesus said, well, Jesus said one of the reasons for His ministry being so totally successful is because He only did what He saw the Father do. And He only spoke what He heard from the Father. Amen? That tells me that for us to be successful, we're going to have to do what we see. And, and that means we're going to have to be able to see into the kingdom of God. And we must, be able to, we must speak what we hear, so we're going to have to be able to hear. And the Bible says he gives us ears to hear as to learn. Amen? Now, the, now in John, turn with me to John chapter 16. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Glory to God. So John chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. It is expedient, it's better for you that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the comforter will not come. Jesus says, it's better for you that I go away. Because if I don't go away, I cannot, be, I, I cannot get on the inside of you. Except I go away I, I, and I die and be raised up, unless this happens, then... We cannot have this duplication so that he can have the representation and that this hurts that might be filled with the glory of the Lord as water cover the sea through us. Amen? So he says, but if I go away, then I will send the comforter, the Holy Spirit. I will send him unto you. And then it goes on to say in verse 12, I have yet many things to say unto you that you can't receive now. But that also tells me there were things they couldn't receive then when they weren't born again that you and I can receive now that we are born again. Amen? And then again in verse 13, it says, How be it? Here is one of the reasons why. When he, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth, he is the spirit of ultimate reality. You see, many times we get caught up in the circumstances and in the environment and, and in history and, and what we feel and, 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 um, and all these other things. And we accept that as truth. We accept what the doctor says as truth, what the lawyer says as truth. And in the meantime, we negate the greater truth, the truth of the Word of God, the truth of what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. And as a result of that, because we embrace another system, and we embrace somebody else's word, and we listen to the voice of the circumstances, what happened? We allow the truth of what God is saying to slip. And the Bible says when you do that, then, you're gonna, then, then, then what happens is you're not able to partake of the great salvation that he has purchased for us. Think about that. Amen? I know that's not a message in and of itself, but it's just inside here somewhere. Amen? That there is a great salvation that belongs to us no matter what we face. There is a great deliverance, salvation, wholeness, preservation, healing, whatever the case might be. That is always available to us. But for, okay, fine. Hold on a second. Let's flip to Hebrews chapter um, 2 for a moment. Because this is bubbling up. I think I've got to let it out. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's like a fire shot up in my bones. <laughs> Might as well release it, amen? All right, fast forward. Hebrews chapter 1, Jesus, God speaking to us by his son. Hebrews chapter 2, that, uh, I mean, uh, and Jesus is risen and, and, and then he's been given all power and all authority and he has received a kingdom and he's received an inheritance and righteousness is the scepter of that kingdom. Angels are subject to him. God says that all the angels of God worship him. He is the very brightness, the very fullness and the full manifestation of my glory. And God said to him, sit down here on my right hand until you make your enemies your footstool. So here in Hebrews chapter 2, it now goes on to say, so therefore, that being the case, what Jesus has done and accomplished, and the reality of where he is right now, we ought to give the more earnest heed. 
which means we are to pay much closer attention to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we let them slip. If we let it slip, what Jesus has accomplished in his death, burial, and resurrection, then what happens? And if, because if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience receive a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was conformed unto us by them that heard? You see, when we let the words and the truth of the sacrifice of Christ slip, then what happened is the great salvation that is available to us, that too slips. Then what happened, we have got, there, there is deliverance, there is an escape from the corruption that is in this world and the limitations that come because of being in this world and being trapped in humanity. But there is an escape and there is a deliverance from that, but the deliverance from that comes from the truth of the gospel and it comes from the reality of what Jesus did in his death, burial, resurrection and ascension and the reality of who we are now that he is risen from the dead. And if we let those truths slip, then the great salvation and deliverance that is ours, we aren't able to walk in it. And then we become subject to what? To the doctor's report. We become subject to the banker. We get, become subject to the circumstances. We become subject to the past. We become subject to all these other things. In the meanwhile, there is a way out. There is a great salvation, but we must not let the truth slip. How does it slip? When you, when you let the word leave your thinking and you listen to something else and you accept some other system, you listen to the voice of the circumstances and whatever else it might be. Are you hearing me? The Bible says there are many voices out, out there in the world and they all have some degree of significance and you need to discern and recognize which one you are to listen to. And you need to cast down, you need to cast down the imaginations and the high things that exalt itself against the knowledge of God and pull down every stronghold and bring every thought to be brought into captivity and to the obedience of Christ. Amen? All right, let's get back over, over there. I got it out. <laughs> Amen? So say, so don't let these things slip. Don't let the truth slip. Say it again. Now, the truth is not circumstances. The truth is not what it looks like. The truth is the word of God. The truth is what Jesus has accomplished in his death, burial, and resurrection. The truth is that which is forever settled in heaven. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. You want to know what the truth is? Look at me. God, Jesus has come to bring us into glory. He's, bringing, he's come to bring us into a place where his life is to become our experience. Think about that. This is what it's all about. That's what God is after. This is why you are here. This is why you are still here. <laughs> you are the life of Jesus is to become your experience and my experience. And all of this learning and all of this studying and all of this, all of this is for that purpose. Because the more of the life of Christ that becomes our experience and our testimony, then the more we have a testimony that will bring deliverance to the world. And the more we have a light shining out of us that will penetrate and bring hope and will bring reconciliation to those that are still sitting in darkness. All right, let's get back over to John chapter 16, verse 13. So how be it then, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, and he shall not speak of himself, but whatever he shall hear, that shall he speak. So he will guide, and he will speak, and he will even show you things to come. Amen? So we have a promise that God will speak, and that God will guide. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Romans chapter 8. Now Romans chapter 8, picking it up in verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Right there is your healing, flowing right out from the inside of you, wells of salvation, rivers of living water, coming right out of your spirit. We're in, we're in the very presence of God and the divine nature of God and where resurrection power dwells and where healing abides. Draw it out. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh, but if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify, 
or kill off the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The Spirit of God leads the sons of God. This, you have a birthright to be led by the Spirit of God. You have got a promise that God will speak and God will guide. What God promises, He performs. Amen? God promises it, He performs it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Verse 15, for we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, God is my Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if we're children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. We are heirs of God, heirs to what? Do you know, uh, <laughs> do you know what your inheritance is? If I could put your inheritance in one word. Somebody say, oh, I've got a great inheritance. What is it? What is my inheritance? God. Say God. Say God is my inheritance. Say it again. You know, and there's some scripture somewhere that says, now go find out what these things mean. I mean, just meditate. God is my inheritance. Whoo, how rich can you be? Say that again. God is my inheritance. Now, if you have an inheritance and you have a need, don't you think it's wise to go to the inheritance and see what supply there is for that need? Well, what need could you have that you already don't have enough inheritance for? Is it wisdom you need? The Lord is the strength of your life. The Lord is your salvation. You have a hope, not just a hope that is in God, but a hope that is from God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say, God is my inheritance. You see, that's what it means in the Psalms when it says, The Lord is my portion. The Lord is your inheritance. Glory to God. We can camp out there. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, God says that He leads, He guides, and He speaks. It is our right. Now, as we trust the Lord to hear from Him and to be led by Him, Especially in the light of the fact that we are carnally trained. We are trained to be dominated by our senses, our reasoning, our logic, and our rational mind. Because of that training, it, it, is, it is somewhat of a hindrance to being led by the Spirit of God. Because you see, to be led by the Spirit of God, you're not depending on those five physical senses. You are depending on a sixth sense. The witness of the Holy Spirit. You are depending on, on God's grace to lead you. And sometimes it doesn't always make sense. Amen? And you shouldn't be looking to that sense realm. Yes, you should discern. Yes, you need to have confirmation and so on. But it is not, we are not to be sense ruled. So, because that is the case, as you endeavor to follow the Lord, lean on Him, listen to His voice, quiet yourself to hear Him, be determined to respond and to obey Him. It is very good to have a foundation of the love of God. You need to know that God loves you. You need to know that whether you've been good or whether you've been bad, whether you've been pretty or whether you've been ugly, I mean in your attitude. <laughs> Regardless of what, He is always working together for your good. There's nothing you can do that ever caused God to say, you know what, you know what? I'm done with her. I'm done with him. I'm going to try to see how I can hurt him. No, God is always looking out for your good. Amen? God's desire towards you is so great that if you can think about your very best desires for yourself, it does not compare with his desire to do you good. Amen? His desire to bless you. And to fulfill his good pleasure in your life is greater than any desire you can ever have for you or anybody else could ever have for you. God loves you. Amen. And God is for you. He is in you, he is with you, but he is for you. Say, God is for me. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Because with the security of that, then you can trust him in all your ways and acknowledge him. So that when everything don't make sense, you don't have to lean on your own understanding, but you can still trust Him. Amen? And you can just fall back and let Him catch you. 
<laughs> Praise the Lord. You like that? <laughs> All right, come on. Get back here. Get, stay here. Stay here. Glory to God. Now, and for that reason, this scripture speaks to me. Psalms 84 and verse 11. You don't need to turn to it. It says, the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. You say, but that's a condition. What is the condition? To them that walk uprightly. His heart is to do good. His heart that is, I'm not going to withhold anything. I want to bless you. But please position yourself. Position it. If the rain is falling over, if, if the shower of blessing is here, you don't want to be over there. And he says the way you're going to be over here where the shower is to them that walk uprightly. What does that mean? That you be perfect, pure, and blameless? No, 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 no. It doesn't mean that. Right? It doesn't mean that. What it does mean is walking accurately in the gospel. Walking accurately, accurately and trusting the grace and the mercy of God. Right? Um, Galatians 2 verse 14, you could write that down and check it out. Walking uprightly and correctly in the gospel. You could also write down Philippians 1 verse 27. Amen? What is the gospel? The gospel is good news, unmerited, undeserved favor. That not based on what you do, but based on what he did. Christ. Amen? When you walk uprightly in that, the Bible says there's no good thing that he will withhold from you. Amen? Now that's very important. Because one of the things, as we talk about hearing and recognizing the voice of God, there is going to be the accusation of the enemy that will accuse you about, of regarding your shortcomings and where you have missed it and the mess that you may have put yourself into. And he's going to come and accuse you and, say, and make you feel that you are not on terms with God for God to talk to you and that you shouldn't expect to hear from God. Amen? When God says, my sheep hear my voice and it is not conditional, as to, it's only conditional on one thing. Are you a sheep? You don't stop being a sheep just because you're bad. I'm not telling you to be bad. Please don't be bad. <laughs> but he doesn't stop speaking. Are we, are we gonna, we're going to come to that pretty soon. But it, it, it is important for you to recognize the blessing of the Lord and the goodness of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God to recognize that it is yours because you believed on Jesus. Amen? And that's it? All right. Now, in this new covenant, on the old covenant, the Bible says, if we were to, the Bible says that God led them by the hand. Amen? He led them by the hand. Out of Egypt, remember how he led them by the hand out of Egypt? God led them from the outside. In the old covenant, God was on the outside trying to get on the inside, leading them by the hand. But in the new covenant, the Bible says, um, there's, the Bible says, um, Psalms 32 verse 8, I will instruct them with my eye. And that's on the inside. In the new covenant, God is leading each and every one of us from the inside. He, God is on the inside trying to get out. In the old covenant, he was on the outside trying to get in. What is the point? The point of the matter is God leads each and every one of us individually. I, um, Hebrews chapter 8 says you don't have to go here, go there. and say, know the Lord, know the Lord. But they shall all know me. I am their father. I am dwelling in them. I will bear witness with their spirit individually at all times. I will lead, I will guide, I will speak. But you see, our minds must be renewed to the mercy of God. Many times we aren't able to believe that he will speak to us because we fall underneath a yoke of condemnation or we think we're not good enough or we think we are inadequate or we become overwhelmed by our failures and, and our shortcomings and there is the accuser of the brethren accusing you constantly, reminding you of where you missed it. Amen? But you need to understand the mercy of God. When you have confidence in the mercy of God and your mind is renewed to that mercy and to that grace, then you're able to be in a place to just accept he speaks to me. Say, God speaks to me. All the time. God leads me because I'm his child. That's it. Amen? Say, it's my birthright to hear from God. Now, we do have to cooperate with him. Deuteronomy 30 verse 19 and 20. It says, I said before you life and death. Choose life. Blessing and cursing. Choose the blessing. In other words, we have to choose to cooperate with him. We have to choose to hear him. We have to, to make choices. And yes, our choices will affect things. But it is not because he's not speaking. Amen? 
And because of the bad choices that we do make from time to time, we could find ourselves in the wrong place. We could find ourselves in the wrong relationship. We could find ourselves in some places, and then he got to come get us out of it. Amen? Or else use his GPS system and redirect us. <laughs> Are you with me? But he's speaking. He is leading. Now what we want to do is we want to be able to discern his voice. We want to be able to, 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 to be alert and sensitive and, and, and discerning regarding his leading so as to make right decisions and especially when there are high risk stuff involved. Amen? Not what shoes you're going to wear. There's no big risk in that unless the heel is too high and as a result you mess with your ankle. You know what I mean? Did you get that? Okay, we picked it up another time. <laughs> no, I don't think we'll pick that up. <laughs> so let it go. Let that let one go. There are high risk decisions and there are low risk decisions. Amen? <laughs> right? You don't have to spend an hour in the closet. You could be out of there in five minutes and decide what it is you're going to wear. That's not a high risk decision. But if it's an issue about who you're going to marry, when, if it's an issue of, 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 of selling your house, moving from one city to then spend an hour in the closet. That's important. You follow me in that? All right, point taken. But understand and have confidence in the mercy and the grace of God and God's willingness to speak to you. Now, God speaking to you is not automatic. Or rather, I shouldn't say God speaking to you is not automatic. Your hearing is not automatic. Right? You have got to mix You've got to believe for it. That's why I'm saying these things to you. And you've got to choose to hear. The Bible says, let him that have ears to hear, let him hear. There's a choice involved. And you've got to set yourself with that mindset. That is why right now, in this teaching, if there is not one thing you should get a hold of, is that I have a right to hear from God, and I am going to hear. I am going to be led and making that decision. Amen? But you also, as you hear from the Lord, you've got to mix it with faith. Speak, Lord. For your servant hear it. Lord, what would you have me to do? What do I do with that? All right? How do I respond to that? A word came forth this morning. How do you mix faith with that? Amen? Because when you mix faith with it, then for one thing, he will speak more, and then that word can profit you. The Bible says the promise didn't profit them because it wasn't mixed with faith. So it's not automatic. You've got to believe and choose to hear, and then you've got to decide to mix the word of God with faith, and then you also even have to learn... Uh, and we will teach this over the next couple of weeks, how to, how to um, not judge, how to test that word to make sure it is God. Amen? Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then, of course, the issue of repentance, which means what? God said we can't walk together if we don't be agreed, which means you might have to change your mind, change your thinking, change your direction, and be willing to. Amen? Hallelujah. All right. Now, um, but I, 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 again... We've said this before, and it's important to know that God is committed to the end point. God is committed to this process of leading and guiding. Even when you miss it, he's like the GPS. He doesn't get mad. He, the vo you ever notice the voice in your GPS don't change? Have you ever missed an exit? The Samantha and the voice, you missed an exit. You better turn back right now. I, I'm hot. No, no, no. She just, she just very nicely says, Make a U-turn at the next corner. Make a right. Uh, that's all. But God is like that. Because you miss it, he's not going to get mad at you. Amen? And he's not going to change his mind about directing you or where he's taking you to. You are his workmanship and there are pathways that he has prepared for you to walk in and he is committed to it. Revelation chapter 3. Let's flip there. Revelation chapter 3. Hallelujah. Revelation chapter 3 verse 19 says, For as many as I love, say God loves me. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. That means what? That's correction. Amen? I mean, as parents, we correct our children. Why do we correct them? Because we don't like them? No, we correct them because we love them. Be zealous therefore on what? Repent. Change direction. Change your mind. And he says, look, I stand at the door and I knock. And if any man will hear my voice, if you hear my voice 
And if you act on hearing my voice by opening the door, mixing faith with what you hear, what will happen? I'm going to come in to him, and I will sup with him, and he with me. In other words, then, this communication is ultimately for the purpose of us having fellowship and relationship. God wants you to know him. God wants you to be intimate with him. Amen? And to him I overcome it, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, and even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. He that had ears to hear, let him hear. There's a choice. Let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to him or to the churches. Amen? All right. Now, we also talked about the fact that, yes, hearing is not automatic. You've got to position yourself. But there are hindrances. Hindrances such as the fact that the world system make you sound like a kook if you're talking about hearing from God. Also, too, is a hindrance when you have these religious people that go around constantly, God told me, God told me. The God told me bunch becomes a hindrance. Because, some, because, of, because of that, people shy back from this issue of hearing from God. Amen? In other words, uh, you know, that becomes a problem. Then again, the fact that the fact that that that, that there, there, there are those, there are churches and there are denominational groups and there are religious groups that don't want to hear from God because if it is, it will threaten. It will threaten. If all the people are hearing from God, then it threatens their authority and their ability to manipulate. Amen. And then, then of course, our carnal upbringing, trusting and having confidence in our senses and our reasoning. And our intellect is also a hindrance. And finally, it is a hindrance simply because some people simply do not recognize the voice of God. They hear it, but they don't recognize it. And that's why we're having this teaching. And now, I should say there is probably a sixth one, which is they don't want to hear from God. Because if they hear from God, then they're responsible. And they don't want to obey God. They don't want to do what God tells them to do. They want to do what they want to do. So it's better to not talk to God. It's better to not hear from Him. Because if I, once I hear from him, now I'm responsible. Amen? But that's not you. Say, so that's not me. I want to hear. I want to respond. I want to obey. I want to walk with God. Hallelujah. All right. All right, let's move into some, 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 some new areas, okay? It is the will of God, and it is, the, it, is, it, is, it is the will of God to lead you, to guide you, and it is your birthright. To hear and to be led by the Spirit of God. Now, if we turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. There are two assumptions that the Bible makes. The first assumption is that there is a God. Verse 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God. And God doesn't spend time and try to give you all the, about it, this theory and that. No, he just says, in the beginning, God, and God talks to you like if you just, that if you, like if you believe it. I'm God. God exists. That's it. And that is why you should not be all caught up in trying to convince somebody else uh, 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 that, that, um, you know, that God is, that God exists. Don't, 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 you know, if God didn't, didn't spend a lot of time doing it, I don't think we should. Amen? You know, it's amazing. And matter of fact, flip with me. Let me show you this verse of Scripture. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Now, I'm not saying that you aren't to communicate to people and share your testimony. Give them the word. But don't believe that you're going to logic them to death. <laughs> or that you're going to logic them into, you're going to logic them into some place of conviction. Amen? The word of God is the power of God unto salvation. Amen? Just give them the word and trust God, the Holy Ghost, to do what needs to be done. Romans chapter 1, I'm just picking on a few verses here. There is a God... And God reveals himself to people. Romans chapter 1 verse 19. Because that, when they, because that which may be known of God is manifest to them. In other words, God says he manifests himself to every person. For God has showed it unto them. That verse means that there is no human being that God doesn't reveal himself to the fact that he is God. You know, it always amazes me with little children how quickly... You will see them respond to the reality of God. And the way they will talk about God. Where did they learn all of this? I mean, yes, as parents we say a few things. But a lot of them is not because we teach them. Some or the other, they just seem to know that there is God. 
And they talk about God in, 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 you know, in, in such a, 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 a manner that it's not a big deal. This is God. Amen. I see it all the time. Why is that? Because God has placed it in them. God reveals himself to every man. It goes on to say in verse 20, And the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. But even verse 20, without verse 20, that says basically, when we just look around at nature around us, it speaks and it declares there's got to be a God. Even without that, verse 19 says, God says that he shows himself unto them. He manifests himself to them. Amen? No, you need to believe that even as you witness the people. The Bible says the grace of God teaches men. There is a grace of God that has come to the entire human race. The Bible says Jesus, God, Jesus says when the Holy Ghost has come, uh, how God will pour out himself upon what? All Christian flesh. All born again flesh. All Baptist flesh. Pentecostal flesh. No, he says he pour his spirit out upon what? All flesh. It means that sinner, the Spirit of God is poured out upon him. Not because he can't speak in tongues. God is there dealing with him. Amen? Now that's another message, but I just need you to know that fact. That there is an assumption in the Word of God that God, that God is. In the beginning, God. Alright, let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. Alright. Now, in Genesis, that's the first assumption. The second assumption is that God speaks. If you read Genesis chapter 1, just between verse 1, just in chapter 1 alone, over 11 times God says, we have God said, let there be a firmament. God said, let there be light. God said, verse 9. God said, verse 14. God said, God said, God said, God said, God said. Do you think we ought to believe that God speaks? That's the very first chapter of the Bible. God said, God said. God speaks. Now, let's, let's, so let's, let's kind of walk through this a little bit and establish the fact that God speaks. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And God wants you to believe that you are designed to hear his voice and that you do hear his voice. Amen. Genesis chapter 1, uh, when Adam sinned, that's in what, chapter 3, is it? Yeah, and, and, um, okay, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, it says, And the Lord God took the man, put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. God spoke to Adam. All right, in Genesis chapter 3, after the fall took place, now you would think, you know, uh, and by the way, let me just set this up right now. As we go through the next two weeks talking about, about hearing the voice of God, discerning the God's voice, the leading of the Spirit of God, learning how to judge it, etc., etc., one of the things that I must consciously, willfully, and do on purpose as we go along is from time to time catch a little religious lie and beat it to a pulp, which means what? Drive, destroy it completely so that it could never rise, it could never be put back together. Amen? You know what I mean by that? You ever try putting, putting back a scrambled egg together? <laughs> Can't do it. Well, that's what I want to do with every religious lie. And, um, for instance, one of them is that if you are in sin, and I'm telling you, don't be in sin, but if you have missed God, or if you are in disobedience, that you are not, that God will stop speaking to you. You may have difficulty hearing him. Amen? You may have difficulty discerning his voice. When you are not delighting in the Lord, it's going to, because he, when you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. One of the reasons why in praise and worship, how many times in praise and worship, during the praise and worship, you sense, and you, you sense some direction from the Lord for you personally, just between you and God. Where God, where, where God witnesses his love to you or God speaks to you. God speaks to people all the time during praise and worship service. You know why? Because in that time they delight in themselves in the Lord. And God began to put desires in them. All of a sudden, in the midst of that praise and worship service, they're thinking, you know what? Maybe I, can, I, maybe I should talk to the pastor and see if I can volunteer to help in this area or that area. Amen? Sangboot. Or in this or in that. Or children. Whatever. 
Why? Because they delight in themselves in the Lord. So when you don't delight yourself in the Lord, delight yourself in His Word, don't, 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 don't fellowship with other believers, don't, you know, um, no praise and worship, then it's hard for God to put those desires in your heart that He wants to lead you with. So, yes, disobedience is a problem, but it's not because God stopped speaking. And it is a religious lie that God is not going to speak to you because something you did or didn't do. In this new covenant, it is not about your doing. In this covenant, it is not about doing, it is about being. Amen? Does that make sense? All right. So here is Adam. Adam fell. I mean, Adam sinned. Adam disobeyed God. And in verse 9, chapter 3, the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Verse 11, and he said, who told you? Adam said he's naked. Adam said he was hiding behind some tree and, 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 and um, covered himself with fig leaves and all that. And God says, he says, I was hiding because I was afraid I was naked. God says, who told you you were naked? So they had a conversation. And this is after Adam fell. Amen? And if we could walk through that. But let me just fast forward for the sake of time. At the end of this chapter, and I, want, I do want to mention this. Now, after they fell, God kicked them out of the garden. Is that right? You remember that? Now, many times, preacher, preachers sometimes will take the fact that God kicked them out of the garden, which means God kicked them out of his presence, and God cut off communication with them. That's not true. Amen? That's not true. You want to see God talking with Cain and Abel and, and all of that. God didn't stop talking to them. God kicked them out of the garden. Why did he kick them out of his garden? So as to get them out of his face? To get them out of his presence? No. Let's read it. Verse 23. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken, as in Genesis 3.23. So he drove them out, he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and, and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. God kicked them out, and God put a cherubim with a sword to keep them from getting back to that tree of life. Why is that? The reason why is, the Bible is because... Um, to keep it from the tree of life when we read it and we, we study it further you will see that if they had eaten of the tree of life then what happened? It's impossible for them to die. What would that mean? It would mean that here you, can you imagine if someone has some, has, has some debilitating sickness um, like what? Give me something painful. I mean leprosy or, 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 or some kind of sclerosis of the liver or, or, or cancer that is eating up their bodies. And, and I mean they're racking with pain 24 hours a day and there is no way out. They're going to have to live with that pain forever and forever and never ever die. How horrible is that? Blind, no hope, just be continually blind forever. So, that is why the Bible says, how precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Because at least in death, they can, they can put off that body with all of its infirmities and with all of its, uh, of its pain and everything else. Now, if they're putting off their body and they're going to hell, then that's, that's not good. But if they put it off the body and they go into heaven, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And the Bible says that's what? Far better. Amen? Now, that is not to mean that if someone, if a believer has some, some severe sickness and pain that is in tremendous agony, that we are to just agree that they must die and leave and go to heaven. I mean, let them get healed and then, and then just stop breathing and go to heaven. Let them, let them get healed and leave a good testimony. You follow me? But having said that, to leave this body is precious in the sight of the Lord when it is a saint leaving. Can you see that? And that was the reason why God put a cherubim to stop them from going back to that tree of life. Are you with me? It had nothing to do with, his, with, 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 his, with him not wanting to communicate with them. On the contrary, what do we see in, in, in Acts, in Genesis chapter 4? 
the story with Cain and Abel. God spoke to Cain in verse 6 and he said, Cain, <laughs> oh boy, there's so many rabbit trails here. Huh? You know, people say sometimes the reason why God did not accept Cain's offering is because Cain didn't bring a blood sacrifice. It was not a sacrifice in blood. He gave God vegetables. And God didn't like that. No. God said that if that God said in verse 7, that first of all, God said in verse 6, Why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? Cain, you got a bad attitude. And then verse 7, and if you will, and if thou doest well, shall not shall shall thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin light to the door. God said your 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 your, your, your offering would be acceptable if you'd have a good attitude. But your attitude is bad. And then he says, not only is your attitude a problem, but on top of that, the Amplified says, um, sin is crouching at your door and it desires to get a hold of you. But you must master it. God spoke to Cain and said, your attitude, I'm not going to use a wordy term, but your attitude is bad. And number two, God was also showing him that sin was trying to get a hold of him and how he could, be, be, how he could master that thing. Amen? Well, you know what happened. He, he went ahead and he killed his brother. What happened after he killed his brother? Verse 9, the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel your brother? God spoke to him after he committed murder. And God said, and he said, and he listened to his attitude. He said to God, I know not, am I my brother's keeper? Now let me ask you something. It's a good question as to how did they know to offer sacrifice to God? God taught them. How did they, how, why, can you imagine you are the first, you are Cain, and you committed the first murder, killed your brother, see his blood shed, see him become totally lifeless, and then you had never ever heard God's voice. And all of a sudden, you hear God says, what did you do? Man, you'd be freaking out, wouldn't you? I mean, like that, would, that, ought to, that's, that ought to petrify you. But God spoke to Cain and said, where is your brother Abel? And you know what Cain's reaction is? I don't know what you're asking me. Am I my brother's keeper? Look, what a, look, look at the attitude. You know why he had the attitude? He was so familiar with the voice of God that it was normal to him. What am I trying to tell you? God speaks. Whether you've been good or whether you've been bad, God speaks. Don't be bad. All right. And um, so we went through the whole episode. Again, again we see, we see, we, we see later on, Genesis chapter 5. Let me, I have to touch that one. Enoch. Enoch, no, Genesis chapter 5, you can read it, it says verse 22. But the Bible says Enoch walked with God. Enoch had such a fellowship with God, and God spoke to Enoch, and God literally, must have to God literally told Enoch that there's going to be a destruction. There's going to be a flood coming that is going to destroy and wipe out the human race. But then God also, when God told him that, and, and, then, and God told him that when you're... Um, God told him that regarding his son, that when this particular son died, then the flood was going to come. Then this judgment was going to come on the earth. So Enoch gave birth to a son called Methuselah. And when Methuselah died, judgment will come. The name Methuselah literally meant something to the extent that, that when he goes, when he goes, they go. When he goes, there is going to be destruction. There is going to be judgment. But as long as he remains here on the earth, the judgment is going to hold off. You know what happened? You know, God is so merciful that Methuselah became the person that, is, that, is, that lived the longest on the earth, 969 years. In other words, God put it off as long as possible. That's the mercy of God. All right? And Methuselah died, it came. But the point of the matter is, God spoke to Enoch. All right? Noah came along, God spoke to Noah. God spoke to Noah about the flood. God even gave Noah the details of how to build the ark. Did he not? Later on, um, in, in Genesis chapter 12, God, God spoke to Abraham. 
God spoke to Abraham, um, a man who was worshipping the stars and the moon, by the way, at that time. This man was a, was a, was a, was a stargazer, a moon worshipper, worshipping false gods, and God spoke to him. Now the Lord God, the Lord, God spoke to a donkey one time. Remember that? God spoke to fish, to the fish, to, to spit out Jonah. God speaks. Now if God is going to speak to a donkey, what's wrong with you? <laughs> How did you get that? Nobody's offended, right? Amen. We were in church. We got to laugh a little bit. A merry heart is as good as medicine. But if God is going to speak to donkeys, I expect he will speak to me. <laughs> Hallelujah. So God spoke to Abraham in Genesis 12. And the Lord God said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And then, of course, Abraham followed. Praise God. Deuteronomy do, do, do chapter 5. I want, this I want you to see. Deuteronomy chapter 5. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Deuteronomy 5. Do you know that when God... When, when the, the children of Israel were in the wilderness, I mean millions of them, think about this for a moment. Do you know when God came on the mountain with a fire and all of that stuff, and the mountain was quaking and shaking and all of that, do you know they all heard God? Do you know God spoke to all of them? Because many times we have a mindset, again, it's a religious mindset. You know, we got certain religious ideas that come to us. Like I remember, I don't know if this happened to you, but I used to think that the, 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 the fruit that, that Adam, that Eve picked was an apple. Where did that ever come from? From those pictures in the children's Bible. <laughs> right? And then we see the snake hanging out of the tree. And it wasn't like that at all. Well, similarly, we have an idea as if Moses went up, Moses got the Ten Commandments, and Moses spoke to the people. And we miss the fact totally that God had spoken to all of them. Amen? Would you like to see that? All right. Or maybe you already know it. But anyway, Deuteronomy chapter 5. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Read it from verse 22. And these words the Lord, Genesis, not Genesis, Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 22. These words the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mount out of the midst of the fire of the, of the cloud and of the thick darkness with a great voice, and he added no more. And he wrote them in two tablets of stone and delivered them unto me. And it came to pass, when you heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness, for the mountain did burn with fire, that you came near unto me, even all the heads of your tribes and your elders. And you said, Behold, the Lord our God hath showed us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the, of the fire. And we have seen this day that God does talk with man, and he lives. Now therefore, why should we die? For this, and this is so illogical. Think about, this is, I mean, I'm telling you, foolishness is dumb. <laughs> I'm serious. These folks just said, God spoke to us and we didn't die. Now we know God spoke to us and we didn't die. Now therefore, why should we die? <laughs> For this great fire will consume us. But I, okay, it's to blame it on the fire, okay. But if we hear the voice of the Lord our God anymore, then we shall die. For who is there of all flesh that had heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of the fire as we have and lived? I'm telling you, that fire really messed with their minds. <laughs> Amen. So, go thou near and hear all that the Lord our God shall say and speak unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee and we will hear it and we will do it. And the Lord heard the voice of, 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 the, of the people and God says, Moses, do what they say. And that's what happened. But they all heard God. Amen? I mean, they all heard God. Say, I hear God. Right? I mean, God is a consuming fire. But do you know where that consuming fire is? All that God is, He is in you. Therefore, that fire is in you right now. And you're here. <laughs> Amen? The old man, he did die, though. 
I don't know, man, I'm on a street here if I yield to it. <laughs> I don't know what I'll say. <laughs> All right, amen. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. All right. And then, of course, the story with Samuel, which is, which, which, let's turn to it, 1 Samuel chapter 3. Glory to God. Now, I'll just tell you the story. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 4 to 11. The essence of it is here is Samuel, um, who was dedicated to the Lord, and he's living in the house of the high priest Eli. And one, one day, he's sleeping, and he, and he hears his name, Samuel, Samuel. And, 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 then, and, so, he, he, uh, and, and so he says, he, did he say, no, what did he say? Here am I. And he went, went into the high priest Eli and said, did you call me? Eli said, no, I didn't call you. Go back to sleep. And he went back to sleep and he heard his name again. And he said, here am I. Came back to Eli. And Eli, Eli, did you call me? Eli said, no, I didn't call you. Go back to sleep. This happened three times. After the third time, Eli perceived that, you know what? God is talking to this boy. So God, now listen to the advice that Eli gave them. Eli told him, um, uh, Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant hear it. And so Samuel went, and he lay down in his place, and the Lord came and stood and called as at other time, and Sam Samuel, Samuel, then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant hear it. Now that was so significant to Samuel's response. Because you see, once Samuel responded that way, then what he was doing is responding to the voice of God with faith. As we get into the, to the how-to, one of the things that is so important is to mix what you hear with faith. When you respond to the word with faith, then it releases God to start showing you some other things. Amen? And it positions you to begin to know what to do with what he said. Does that make sense? So that's what Samuel did. But again, God is speaking. Now, um, let's go to two other situations. Let me, let me just tell you this one here. Elijah. Elijah was running from, um, from Jezebel. Jezebel said, I'm going to wipe you out. Right? You know, I mean, Elijah had killed 400 prophets and, 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 of, of, of Jezebel's prophets. She didn't like that. She got upset and she said, what you did to these prophets, I'm going to do to you. I'll finish you off. And I mean, and he got all depressed and stuff like that. And he was running and hiding and so on. And, um, and then he had an encounter with God, etc., etc. And he, he was hiding in a cave. God came and spoke to him. What are you doing here in this cave? He says, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm hiding. <laughs> he said, I'm, you know, I, 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 everybody has forsaken you and I'm the only prophet left. Anyway, and God went, and I think he went and stood in a mountain or something, and then God spoke to him. Now, what happens is that, first of all, while he was standing in this place, there was a, there was a, um, a wind that came, and this wind came, and it, it began to shake stuff, rip stuff, rip, rip up rocks and stuff like that. I mean, it was a violent wind. And then after that, there was an earthquake that began to shake stuff, and, 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 and then there was a fire. And the Bible says God was not in the wind, he was not in the fire, he was not in the earthquake, and then he heard a still, small voice. And, and, and then God said. In that story, the point of the matter is, how does God speak to you and I? He is speaking to us. He's on the inside. He's not dragging us with the hand. He's on the inside. He's leading and he's guiding. And, and um, in, as God speaks, he speaks, and it's very much like a still, small voice. Because it's like a still, small voice, it is so important that you and I learn how to slow down, quiet down, to be in a place where we can hear. Amen? Many times people don't hear because they're too busy. I mean, this generation, the generation that, that, that is on the earth right now, are in a dangerous position to, to, to become so, so deaf to the voice of God and to be in a place of, of despising the, the, the voice and the word of God. I mean, first of all, the, the media and everything else trains them to, to, to think that to hear from God is spooky. Um, they, 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 they're also in, 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 in a place where, 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 where they can worship the intellect and stuff like that. Right? Now, not all of them, but there is that potential. But they're also in a generation where there's something stuck in their ears. Right? You know, there used to be a thing called ghetto blaster. That's gone. They don't have ghetto blaster now, but now they have what? iPhone and P phone and Q phone and R phone and, and all kinds of stuff stuck in their ears. And they can't hear God. Right? And who knows what's coming up next? Right? <laughs> And so, I mean, they're constantly they're busy, busy, busy. They're on the way. They're going. Where are you going? I don't know, but I'm going. <laughs> they're busy. They, they wouldn't slow down. They wouldn't put themselves in the position to hear. 
In order, God's voice is a still small voice. And the Bible says in Psalms 46, verse 10, be still and know that he is God. Now the truth is you can train yourself. That is one of the benefits of praying in tongues. That you could be in a room full of people screaming and whatever happening and things happening around you. But you can learn to develop a quietness within you. That puts you in position to be able to hear. I believe, you know, as the Bible says uh, uh, in First um, Peter chapter 3, and I think it's verse verse 14 or something there, when it was talking about a, 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 about a, a, about a, a wife with a meek and a gentle spirit that is able to, to, to bring her, to be able to have such an impact on that unsaved husband, I believe that's a type of how we are to be. Because in your spirit, your spirit is meek, gentle, kind, and that same meekness and gentleness in your spirit, need, you need to put that on. And then as you have that, and as you study to be quiet and to be in that place and learn to be still, you can be in a place to be able to hear the voice of God. Amen. And why is it necessary? Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 10, there's many voices out there. Right? 1 John chapter 4 verse 1 says that you got to try the spirits because there's all kinds of spirits out there. Right? So we got to be able to hear and we got to be able to discern. But we can't be in a hurry. We can't be in a hurry. We could hurry, but don't be in a hurry. Do you know how to do that? The Bible says, he that believes shall not make haste. Now, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 30, and we're going to close here. Now, Isaiah chapter 30, and we are going to close here. Amen? Say, I'm designed to hear the voice of God. Hearing God is my birthright. Hallelujah. Now, Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 19 says, For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem, and thou shalt weep. Isaiah what? 30. 20. Oh, I'm reading the wrong verse. All right. Verse 20. And, 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 and though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore. But thine eyes shall see thy teachers. Now, hear me for a moment. I am here in the office of a teacher by, by the calling of God and the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen? And so he says, God says you're going to see your teachers. You, you, I hope you can see me. All right? Okay. But, but ultimately you are hearing me with your outer ears. All right? And have you ever noticed, have you ever noticed the, human, the design of the human ear? Can you imagine somebody's ears, my ears are this way, and I know I've got a good set of them, <laughs> right? But can you imagine if someone's ears, instead of being this way, pointing forward, they were that way, pointing backward? That would be pretty. <laughs> or it wouldn't be. But the reason why the ear is pointing forward is because of the fact that we, we listen with this out here, and the person we're listening to is in front of us. To some degree, all right? That's the point he's trying to make. But look at the next verse. But your ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, this is the way walk ye in it. When the Lord speaks that still small voice, sometimes it will sound like if it's from behind you. You know, did somebody say that? Who, who spoke? Nobody spoke? Am I hearing things? In other words, the hearing of the voice of God comes differently. And we got to become trained to hear. Study to be quiet. Position ourselves to hear. Develop a meek and a quiet spirit. Be teachable. And then ultimately, as we learn to hear, then the Bible says that he that is spiritual judges all things. Then we also learn how to discern, how to divide the word, how to, how to recognize, is this, coming from, is this me or is this him? Is this coming from the intents of my heart? Is this coming from my soul or is this coming from my spirit? And God has given us means by which we can not only we can judge and discern, but he's given us witnesses. I think last week I said there's 10 witnesses. Well, I went a little bit further and studied and checked a little bit more. There are actually 14. 14 witnesses that the Lord has given unto us by which we can use and judge. Is this God or is this not? Amen? And as, and as we go to next week, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some of those witnesses. And hopefully we'll talk about the primary leading witnesses. And then there's another group that are to be confirming witnesses. What do I mean by leading witness? The scripture is supposed to be a leading witness. You, it's a witness that leads. You need confirmation, but that leads. There's a witness that comes from, your, from the Holy Ghost that is a leading witness. But then there's a witness that might come through prophecy, that might come through circumstance. 
and those are not leading witnesses, but they are to confirm what God has already spoken to you. And if you don't know the difference, and then of course, even when we get into prophecy, there are different kinds of prophecy. One of them that is directive, and you've got to have confirmation. If you don't, then you could miss it real bad. Amen? Next thing you know, you're somewhere out in Argentina as a missionary, and God never sent you there to be a missionary. Amen? But at the same time, if God's sending you, you want to know. And you want to have things confirmed. Especially when it comes to serious decisions. So we need to understand what has God provided. And then there is, the, there is, there is this deception that if, as if as soon as you hear God, bam. No, 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 no. God delights in confirming to you that he is speaking. He wants you to know it's him. He wants you to operate in confidence. He don't want you to be somewhat guessing. Did I hear God or did I not hear God? He wants you to know. Amen? So he says, try the spirits, test the spirits. Right? The Bible says, let every word be confirmed with two or three witnesses. And so on. So next week, we are going to begin to look at the witnesses, the primary witnesses, the leading witnesses, and the confirming witnesses. And we're going to know how they are. And given that God already speaks, we will now begin to be equipped to be able to discern and dissect and recognize what is he saying to me. Amen?